Welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the In the Know with the Bullioness. I'm Dawn Marie, a 7K Metal Silver Associate and a top recruiter, and I want you to join me in welcoming return guest, economics, and precious metals enthusiast, A.G. Leverage, to the show. Welcome, A.G. Dawn, hello. How are you today? I'm great. Happy Saturday to you. Thank you. Today's topic we're going to discuss is real estate versus gold and silver. Which hard asset is best? Okay, so AG, as far as real estate goes, do you consider it to be an asset? So we've been raised to believe that buying real estate is a necessity. In fact, we've been told that the American dream is to own your home. We've been told by our parents, who've also purchased homes, that homes is freedom. We've been told by our schools, we've been told by our universities, we've been told by our, by our culture that the goal is to buy the home the, the, with the picket fence and the, two, the what is it, 2.3 children and, and a dog, and that, that is happiness and that's fulfillment. But, and even though on our ledgers with our accounting, we put our home down as an asset, <clears throat> is it really an asset? Well, it depends. If, if we define asset as something that is there for as an actual asset, uh, here, here's a better question. Is real estate that is purchased not better defined as a liability? And, and I think an example of two twin brothers might be the best there is. And I read this in a book, and I apologize, Don. I, I don't recall what book this was. But two brothers would, were, were, were placed as an example, and we'll call them Mark and Roger. Mark, and let's pretend they're both 25 years old. Mark goes ahead and buys a half a million dollar home. <clears throat> he puts down 10% on the half a million dollar home, and Roger does not buy the home. It's a four bedroom, two bath. Roger instead leases the home. He goes out to rent that same exact house. After the down payment, after the... More, uh, the insurance and the taxes, Mark's monthly comes to about $4,000 a month after his town payment, after his uh, taxes and insurance and so forth. And Roger, uh, Roger rents out that same exact home for $2,500 a month. Now, all this time we've used our real estate as a method by which to save money. The average American will buy a home for a set amount of uh, for a set price, and 30 years later, that same half a million dollar home now can sell for 2.2 million dollars, and that has been a definition of our ability to save money. That and the 401k slash deferred comp slash pension programs, those are the two methods that we know how to save money. And so, going back to the example, and I don't want to confuse the names here. It's it's. Uh, it's, we started with Mark who bought the home and Roger who rents, correct, Don? Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah, yeah. Mark bought it and Roger's the renter. Great. Okay, so let's, let's stick with that. So provided that Roger goes ahead and puts the difference that he pays in his rental per month versus what, what uh, Roger pays, I'm sorry, what Mark pays, then Roger's going to come up ahead after 30 years. In other words... The difference in, in the mortgage versus the rent is about $1,500 a month. So Roger goes ahead and puts that, that savings away. Pardon me. Mark bought it and Roger's renting. There, sorry. Yeah, I have the, I have the underlined this. So Roger, <laughs> as long as Roger goes ahead and puts away the difference on a monthly basis, that $1,500 a month, month after month after month, he's going to turn out in a better position than Mark who bought the property. Because beyond the difference in, in, the, in the purchase versus the rent, there's also the deposit that Mark had to come in with. In this case, he came in with 10%. But even if he came in with less, lesser, let's pretend he came in with 3%, 3 to 5%, and he had a higher interest rate, he, even then, Roger's still just going to be able to put away more on a monthly basis. Now, beyond that, Mark, in order to achieve the increase in equity in property value at the end of 30 years, during those 30 years, he must 
redo the, the plumbing. He must redo the electrical. He must uh, renew the roofing several times. He has to do the siding and or the stucco, the windows, the doors, the HVAC, the heater. And he might do a complete kitchen remodel or a bathroom remodel or a room addition. So all of that monies that Mark has to put into his property to, to shoulder the property value, Roger does not. Roger puts that money away, that same amount of money puts it away, and he saves it. Now, the question is, what does he save it in? How does he save it? Does he keep it in the form of dollars? Because, again, we know that the Federal Reserve already tells us that we're on a 2% inflation rate every year. No. Instead, Roger puts it away in the form of precious metals, and he holds it. And this way, his money is, it may not increase enormously during those 30 years, but at a minimum, it'll hold its purchasing value. At the end of 30 years, when Mark goes to sell that property, now Mark hasn't added up his monthly with the taxes and insurance included. After 30 years, uh, let's say a 3.6% interest rate, a half a million dollars purchase price, and he's able to sell it 30 years later for $2.2 million. He nearly paid that much when you add up all his monthlies together to the $2.2 million. Plus the upgrades, the maintenance, the remodels, and all the investments into the home to keep it at a $2.2 million valuation after 30 years is approximately another million and a half spread out between 30 years. So Mark has invested into that home exactly what he's going to get out of it. Whereas Roger, who went ahead and put the money away, the difference away, instead of buying the home and instead of, of, of fixing the home and maintaining a home, he put it into savings in the form of precious metals. He has well over a million and a half dollars available to him after 30 years to spend it as he sees fit. So from this criteria, real estate is a liability as opposed to an asset. Amazing. And to be in fairness, are you using this example as your primary or would it be the same if it was like an Airbnb, if it was a use for Airbnb or, or a rental? That's a very big difference. So we're talking about a single family residence. If we're talking about somebody who, let, let's, let's go back to that same example of the two brothers. So Mark goes ahead and has a four bedroom, two bath, and Mark and his wife have no children. So they lease out two rooms in their home. They lease them out at $50 a night. They lease them out four times a week. That is $400 per week that he can now take off from his liability. 400 a week, 52 weeks. Uh, he's looking at, what is it, over $20,000 in a year. Um, that's a nice amount of money that he, that he could not have perpetuated in any other way. So that would certainly help. I'm also not speaking about uh, an apartment building, whether it's a duplex, triplex, quad. Obviously, and then let's pretend that Mark lives in that one of them and he leases out the difference. That brings in a monthly rent roll. So that, again, is, is, uh, cannot be a comparison here to, to what I'm saying. I'm talking strictly and specifically about someone who says right now in this moment in time, who says, I'm enthusiastic because I'm going to buy my first home. And when yeah, someone and says live that, in it. Yep. and live in it, correct. But even if they're not going to live in it, even if they're going to rent it out, the prices are so high that, that the rents will never justify the, the rental on a, on a half a million dollar home, even at 10% down, a four bedroom, two bath in an average Southern California marketplace area, you're going to rent it out for $3,000 to $3,600 a month on an average. So you're not, you, the, the owner's still going to have to put in four to $600 a month just to keep it. So even renting it out wouldn't work that way. But whether we're talking about income property, which is any apartment mix, or whether we're talking about commercial property again. Now, commercial, sorry, if I'm going to jump on this one, Don. No, go right ahead. In, a commercial property investment would make enormous sense because the, the commercial the apartment building owner has to come in and in between tenants fix up the unit, has to come in and do plumbing, electrical, when something breaks or something wears or something needs fixing, remodeling, or replacement, that apartment building owner must come in and do so. In a commercial property unit, uh, let's say a, a, a corner lot, let's say a um, a small uh, quad area with a barbershop at a 7-Eleven and, uh, and a, let's say, a tattoo place, uh, they're not responsible for 
upgrades. They're not responsible for the remodeling of what that business personality needs to look like. Uh, Starbucks, 7-Eleven, any of those, they're responsible for their own upgrades and their own upkeep. Sometimes the commercial property owner is only responsible for the roof or only responsible for the parking area. But beyond that, it's not much more. So that is true leverage where the owner would actually rent roll. Um, but in a single-family residence, that is not the case. And also, I just wanted to clarify, when you said um, put it into precious metals, do you mean physical precious metals? Would it be the same if I want to put it in gold um, stocks, bonds? No, it wouldn't. In this case, Precious metals have outperformed even stocks and bonds for the last 30 years, uh, especially gold, I should say. Uh, no, I'm, I'm suggesting precious metals that are, that are physical, that are in one's possession. I'm not speaking about a precious metals that are stored in a third-party vault. I'm not talking about ETFs, GLD, SLV, or anything else that is a stock. Uh, even a mining stock, which right now are, are doing well and, and are about to do even much better, uh, I'm suggesting physical silver held in one's position that is managed by oneself. Excellent. Okay. Those are amazing numbers. That's just amazing for everyone to see. And, you know, back in 2008, I did lose everything. And I was very frustrated with the fact that I, you know, at that time it was through Bank of America and we heard all the stuff that happened with Bank of America. I went through three modifications over the course of three years and there was so much confusion within Bank of America. They lost the paperwork, so much stuff. And so by the third year, I was so exhausted because it was, am I keeping the house? Am I losing the house? And it just felt like a complete way that they could just transfer the wealth. And so from that, I realized I created a belief system that I don't want to deal with the real estate to put my hard-earned money into something that could possibly be taken away. And it felt very counterproductive to what society is saying. As you said, it's saying, buy, buy, buy real estate. And so I'm so happy to hear what you've said because essentially on an intuitive level, that's exactly what I've been doing. I've been just being the renter, stashing away gold and silver. That's amazing. Thank you for that validation. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. So is this a good time to buy real estate? For the things that you just said, the answer is no. Is there a good time? Is there a great time to buy real estate? Yes, when, when it's on the floor, when it's at the bottom. But it's like all things. We do not want to buy things that are at the top of the market, be that stocks, be that real estate, be that precious metals. Right now, the reason that, that I harp on precious metals that you and I both do is because they're at the bottom. And we want to buy things that are unpopular, that nobody's noticing, things that are sure bets to go up, and that is precious metals. On the other hand, real estate is at the top of the market, and so is the stock market, and so is the bond market. Unless those three different groups continue to get cheap money, continue to get bailouts, that's the only way that those can continue in an inflationary ma uh, manner. Remember, real estate itself became expensive because of cheap money that was out there available for the real estate to begin with. And all those mortgages were repackaged and resold from bank to bank to investment firm to pension plan to retirement plan over and over again. And that's what created our, our last mortgage collapse. Uh, is that how is that how real estate cl climbed so quickly and became so unaffordable? That's exactly how it climbs so so quickly. That's why that that's why so many people are unable to, to to tap into being able to purchase a home. Now the worst part about it is after the banks go ahead and create the scenario where the they make the homes super expensive for the average person because they put in cheap money into in the home to begin with, they sold it and resold it several times. On the other side, they then make some more cheap money available for the potential homeowner to access that money to buy that home. And so what it does is it continues to raise the price of these homes artificially. And then lastly in that same equation is once that homeowner is in there and they find that their, their mortgage is just 
pretty high in price and they still want to be able to live comfortably, they then start to use that home as a credit card and they remove equity from that very home in order to subsist, in order to, as, as a form of a credit card to, to live. And so you create this, this giant zombie marketplace of real estate where the prices are artificial. So is it a good time to buy real estate? No. Is it the American dream? Does it give us freedom? Does it equate happiness? No. What, it, what equates happiness is peace. And a person right now could rent a very nice, comfortable home of their dreams for a fair price, and they can save, they can stash, they can live within their means. And in, in the coming years, when this real estate bubble does finally pop, they can get out there and purchase at a comfortable price. It's something they can afford. And that, that, is, that is my suggestion for, for health, for peace, and for longevity. Yeah, when, it, when it, the real estate's at the bottom, that's the time to buy. That sounds that's perfect. Correct. That makes perfect sense to me. Well, <laughs> in closing, would you like to share with us any tip of the day for our Saturday pertaining to some of the things we talked about or beyond. You know, Don, in this case, a lot of times we're busy chasing our tail. We're so busy. You and I included, we're all so inundated with, with commitments, with obligations, with personal goals. And a lot of times, so what I personally try to do is is bring up subjects to people where they can consider ways of not getting into this rat trap of trying to keep out of it. In other words, if they work, that they're doing it for joy. If they work, that that it's something they would do for free anyway, as opposed to having to work because they they're the, they have a brand new car in their driveway, because their child is in a private school, because they have this giant home mortgage, and et cetera, et cetera. All these things that we pile one on top of another, and at the end of the day, it stresses us out. It it makes us unhappy, and there's nothing worse than seeing someone or a family who appear to have it all from the outside, they certainly have all the physical means, um, but they, don't, they have this cavity within their heart. There's a vacancy within them, and you can see it. You can sense it. They're not joyful. They're not generous. They're not happy. They seem upset. They seem angry. And it's because these physical things do not, at the end of the day, equate happiness. They don't. I know that we've been told hoard and buy the sea dews and the boats and the bigger, the better. And it just isn't true. At the end of the day, having moments and memories, a simple meal, a homemade meal with a family member, uh, spending time in the forest or at the beach or by the lake, things that one can do for free or affordably are fantastic and they're beautiful. They're things that we dismiss now. Instead, we spend time on our phones, on technology, and on just things that don't, that cannot fill us. It just will not fill us. So I talk about hoarding precious metals and gold and silver because that is true money. That's true wealth that has value in and of itself. Uh, that is the one thing that, that we can actually, believe it or not, hoard. And nothing bad can come from it because it's here for us to use as, as a preservation of savings of a lifetime. And those are beautiful things. Those are wonderful hobbies and habits to get into. Uh, even Even for those people that I know that that sell precious metals, but they do it to get back into fiat. They do it to get back into the paper form. They too do not realize that the ultimate goal is to end with metal stacking, with precious metals, because that equates comfort. A person who has a level of savings in the form of metals can get out there and face the world in an incredible way, knowing that they have little to zero uh, credit card debt, little to zero debt on, on a car payment, little to zero debt on a second or third home or some kind of fun vehicle or some kind of fun boat ride, there's nothing that makes one feel better than knowing that they're responsible for their own finances. And tomorrow, should something not go right, they're going to be just fine. I affirm 100% what you just said. You know, one thing before I learned about gold and silver, if I heard about precious metals, it seemed boring. If I heard about silver and gold, I was attracted to it. And so what I wanted to share with those that may not know about this, you know, the collectibles, 
is it's so much fun as we mentioned in one of the earlier segments there is a natural attraction to gold and silver and most people under the age of 50 have never even touched real gold and silver or maybe silver coins i should say or gold coins of course you've touched jewelry but there is so much fun in it creating it as a hobby and as you said just doing some of the simple things you know just two weeks ago I sat down with my parents and we went through the coins that they had in a bank and we went through and found real silver that was pre-1965 and we were so excited about it it crosses the generations there's so many really fun cool designs it's just really fun so I concur a hundred percent awesome so in In closing, I would like to thank you all for listening, and remember, do subscribe, do hit that notification button, and if this message resonates with you and you know people that need to hear it, please share it with others, support our efforts, and take a look at silverpreparedness.com. That's silverpreparedness.com. Now, I'm going to mention to you today to seize the day, and This is not a high pressure thing, but today I was contemplating thinking some people are driven and some people don't feel an urgency. And I'll do it when I can do it. And I realized that I've always seen things as windows of opportunity. And what that means is it doesn't mean that necessarily silver and gold aren't going to be here tomorrow, but what if it's a shoulda, coulda, woulda moment and that things shift and not necessarily doomsday-ish, but I'm just saying consider, I think those that are the most successful seize the day, take that momentum, are productive, don't keep procrastinating. So take a few minutes, carve out a little time today, go to silverpreparedness.com, watch the information there. You've heard it here from AG Leveraged. There's, um, in his wisdom, there's very valuable information on the website. See if it resonates with you. And if so, begin this journey today. So until our next segment, we want to tell you and invite you to have an amazing day and um, look forward to you tuning in for the next one. Bye for now.